Non, mais ça marche pas. Ah, en fait, c'est pour la vidéo YouTube. Non, non, non c'est pour euh, la vidéo YouTube. Ah, pardon, excusez-moi, pas de souci. Excusez-moi. Donc, les deux rapporteurs, donc M. Renaud Masson à ma droite, qui est directeur de recherche au CEA Cadarache. Ensuite, M. Julien Yvonnet, qui est professeur à l'université Gustave Eiffel, donc à ma gauche. Ensuite, juste à ma gauche, Noël Laëlec, professeur à Aix-Marseille Université. Ensuite, M. Corrado Morini, professeur à Sorbonne Université. Je les cite dans... dans, dans... Mais quand même, en extérieur, nous avions aussi, euh, avant, Hélène Vellman, qui est donc euh, maître de conférence habilité à l'Université de Toulouse. Voilà. Et puis, donc, l'équipe encadrante resserrée. Donc, euh, Madame Sophie D'Artois, maître de conférence à Sorbonne Université. Et Monsieur Jim Edocondo, professeur à Sorbonne Université. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Alors, donc, euh, ben, selon l'usage, vous avez 45 minutes, je pense que c'est comme ça ici, hein, 45 minutes pour présenter vos travaux de thèse. Et puis ensuite, euh, on entamera la deuxième phase de discussion. D'accord. À vous la parole. Merci. Donc, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Donc, euh, merci aux membres du jury. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Euh, merci aux rapporteurs. Euh, merci d'être là aujourd'hui. Donc, euh, pour ma présentation d'aujourd'hui, je vais la faire en anglais. Et la discussion qui va s'en suivre, bien sûr, elle peut se faire en français euh, selon vos préférences. Bien. Uh, so during my PhD thesis, I've been working towards establishing a nonlinear homogenization method for uh, elasso damageable composites, and that is through the extension of incremental variational approaches. So this work has been carried out here at Institut Jean Laurent d'Alembert under the supervision of uh, Jimmy Docondo and the co-supervision of Sophie D'Artois. So to put our work in a general context, we'll be talking about composites throughout the whole presentation. A composite is uh, usually made up out of two or more materials, and when put together, they create a stronger, uh, more lightweight, and more flexible, and also, if needed, with better uh, conductivity than the two component materials on their own. So this class of materials are used in many industries to uh, manufacture high-performance products uh, at an economic advantage. And so these industries range from uh, space to snowboarding and include manufactured products for aircrafts, transportation, medical use, um, and so on. However, these great properties, as great as they can be, they can still be, uh, they can still be altered by damage uh, phenomena when subjected to mechanical loadings. And this is due to microcracking in the matrix, for the example, or to a decohesion in the interface between the, the, the matrix and the reinforcement, as it can be seen uh, right over here. Now, more concretely, uh, this damage is characterized by a significant degradation of mechanical properties uh, through the initiation and growth of microcracks and microvoids. Now, as these materials are being used in more than one aspect in our, in our daily lives, it is only fair and of great importance to be able to predict their behavior circumstantially in, in any given situation. And thankfully, much work has already been done in this field uh, through the introduction of homogenization uh, methods, which uh, roughly said is the um, replacement of a heterogeneous solid by a homogeneous equivalent one that behaves macroscopically in the same manner as the heterogeneous uh, solid. So moreover, in 1998, Pierre Suquet and his team in Elema Marseille have conducted uh, numerical simulations on uh, an elastic fiber composites for three different types of mattresses. An elastic matrix, uh, a plastic matrix with and without uh, isotropic hardening. And as you can be seen here in the results, uh, there's a strong interface heterogeneity in the strain fields when the matrix is plastic. And so basically taking into account these interface heterogeneities uh, in the formulation of the mechanical behavior laws for composites constitutes nowadays a big challenge and a major issue in solid mechanics. Because, well, when we're in the domain of linear elasticity, there are many methods that are available. HLB method, Ashton Schleckmann bounds, Voigt and Rus, etc. And as we leave this domain of linear elasticity, uh, these methods are, cannot be used as is. Now, of course, there are other uh, methods that are available, nonlinear homogenization methods, uh, which also characterize the local behavior of the constituents. 
uh, which can be provided, for example, through advances, advanced numerical homogenization techniques, where we can use, for example, the infamous finite element method or the fast Fourier transform approach. Now, although there are indeed um, parallelization methods that can be applied, uh, they still somehow are very time consuming. So in order to circumvent this high computational cost and also to facilitate structural computation, uh, semi-analytical methods have been introduced. Now, these semi-analytical methods, they have the ability of providing uh, reasonable estimates, such as the TFA, the transformation field analysis, which was introduced by Dvorak in 1992, or the NTFA, the non-uniform transformation field analysis, which was introduced by Michel and Suquet in 2003, uh, and all this in the, in the case of elastoviscoplastic composites, and the NTFA being the generalization of the TFA. Now, this class of methods is known to have a strong numerical resolution component uh, applied on a pretty explicit microstructure. And this differs from the classical mean field approaches, uh, analytical methods where in this case the microstructure that we're using is not defined in such detail and the local fields are uh, approximated by their averages over the phases. Now the work that we're presenting in this thesis falls under this category of methods. So in order to introduce them, it is important to go through the pioneering work of Hill of 1965. Uh, which can be seen as a linearization around the first order moment. And thanks to the variational formulation, it was seen that it was important to be able to take into account um, heterogeneities of the fields, and that is taken in, uh, into account through the second order moment. Now, these methods make it possible to study nonlinear behavior that is governed by one nonlinear potential. So when we want to study nonlinear behavior that is governed by two, non by two uh, potentials, Lilek and Suke in 2007 have, uh, have paved, the, paved the way in the nonlinearization, in the nonlinear homogenization methods where they introduced the EIV model or the effective internal variable um, model which has been developed by and still is being developed by many other authors, by the same authors, for example, in 2013 when they introduced the RVP, which is a formulation made in the rate form, or in the case of elastoplasticity, for example, for Brassard et Al in 2011 or Boudet in 2016, uh, in viscoelasticity, for example, Tresso in 2023. And in 2016, Agoras introduced um, an approach where basically the nonlinear behavior and the non-uniformity of the fields have been treated separately instead of simultaneously, which is the case uh, for the EIV. And this approach has been used in the PhD that was conducted by Antoine Luqueta in 2019 uh, here at Institut Jean Laurent d'Alembert, where he studied the elastoviscoplastic composites with or without uh, hardening. Now, all of these above methods have uh, as the same main focus, which is globally elastoviscoplastic composites with or without hardening. With the exception of the PhD that has been conducted by Vincent Gauthier in 2021 uh, in Aix Marseille University, which was co-supervised by uh, Renaud Masson and uh, uh, Mia Garage, where he worked on elasto-damageable composites, where basically he uh, provided an approach that suitably combined between um, analytical methods and theoretical and numerical homogenization uh, for a material that is used in nuclear uh, and industry. All right. This brings us to today's topic, which is the development of a nonlinear homogenization method for elasto-damageable composites, and that is through the extension of the incremental variational framework. Now, more specifically, our approach is based on the incremental variational principle introduced by Lilek and Suquet, which is based on the variational principle of Ponte Castaneda of 1991. Now, the latter basically uh, it, it, it consists of uh, applying two different steps, a linearization step and a homogenization step. The first one consists in applying a rigorous approximation of the initial nonlinear constitu constitutive behavior by introducing uh, an LCC or a linear comparison composite, which is then, which can then be easily uh, homogenized using uh, any classical homogenization scheme. 
Now, in regards to elastodamageable composites, the difficulties that we foresee at this point are, on the one hand, the coupling between damage and elasticity, and on the other hand, damage induced by uh, softening. Now, after this introduction, we can now move on to the heart of uh, the work carried out in my PhD. And to do so, there are mainly three components to this presentation. The first one revolving around the principle we put to use, which is the incremental variational model. Um, as we introduce its general methodology, this will also allow us to very briefly talk about what was previously done in the PhD of uh, Antoine Luqueta. This will also set the grounds for this principle's um, extension to elastodamageable composites, where we'll be discussing the model's formulation, which is uh, the main objective of, of, of my work. As we move on to the analysis of the model's uh, predictions and a first an analytical uh, evaluation. Now, the following evaluation will be uh, numerical, which will be the main topic of the second component of the presentation where we use full field computations. So as we ease our way into the use of gradient damage uh, approach for the numerical evaluations, we'll first introduce them, of course, to later on be able to uh, easily use them for the assessment of the theoretical model in the case of a two-phase composite. And finally, the last component of the presentation will be dedicated to the extension of the developed model to, um, to a case where we account for the hardening in uh, brittle matrix uh, composites, which will then, of course, be also evaluated numerically. All right, so without further ado, let's start with a brief introduction of um, the incremental variational principle. So as previously uh, said, here we rely on uh, the, 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 the variational, the incremental variational principle introduced by Laila Kensuke in 2007, which was, um, which was based on the framework of generalized standard materials. Now, this class of materials, basically their nonlinear behavior is described using two potentials, uh, the free energy W and the dissipation potential phi, which depend on the elastic strain, epsilon, and on the internal variable alpha. Now, depending on the nonlinearity that we're studying, alpha will, I will either be uh, the inelastic strain or will be the, the, the damage uh, variable, which could be a scalar. So the the nonlinear non sorry the nonlinear behavior here um, to, to to introduce the problem technically further down the road what we're looking for is to be able to use the classical uh, homogenization schemes. Now at this stage it is deemed impossible and the reason is being that we have two pot potentials instead of one. So our main goal in this step is to be able to introduce a unique potential that will allow us to take into account both uh, conservative and dissipative behavior at the same time. And that can be done through the generalized standard materials framework as we introduce the constitutive equations where the first equation basically is the constitu constitutive law that describes sigma the second equation is also known as the Biot equation, where, as it can be seen, relates the free energy to the dissipation potential through this equation. Now, the problem that we have in hand is a differential time problem. Uh, and to solve the time part, we discretize it by an implicit Euler scheme, and in which uh, we will estimate the rate of the incremental variable alpha by alpha n plus 1 minus alpha n uh, out of delta t. So to simplify the, the presentation for the notation, we will omit the subscript n plus 1 for the, rest of the, for the rest of the presentation. So in the GSM framework, and from these equations, we can introduce uh, the incremental potential j, taking into account, as previously said, both uh, conservative and dissipative effects of the behavior, such as the Bio equation would correspond to the Euler-Lagrange equations providing the solution of the variational problem that is defined by W delta, which is the incremental condensed uh, potential, which can be obtained through the minimization of J by respect to uh, alpha, the internal variable. And this finally allows us to define the behavior using here a single potential. All right, so what we're looking for is a representative elementary volume of uh, the composite. We're looking for a macroscopic relationship that will relate the average strain in the REV to the macroscopic stress, which is therefore the average of stress fields. 
So we can rewrite the equations defining the local problem here, this time only using a unique potential where we have the equilibrium, the, the local behavior, and the, the boundary conditions. So uh, the condensed incremental potential here can also be defined by minimization of j with respect to the internal variable j, uh, alpha. Um, and here, our incremental potential j is defined using uh, the, the indicator function, uh, which defines the distribution of the phases. Uh, here, of course, all the phases are, um, are, are, uh, are considered to be of standard generalized type, of course. So we then proceed to a minimization with respect to epsilon, allowing us to um, introduce the effective condensed incremental potential, describing the macroscopic behavior of the composite. So this is the fundamental basis of, of the model that is common between, say, uh, the EIV, the DIV, which we'll be talking about right after this um, this, this uh, transparent, then will be, uh, and also the, the, the model that we worked on developing during the PhD. So as I said earlier at some point during the introduction, following Lilek and Shiki of 27, 2007 and Agoras of 2016, uh, during his PhD, Luketa adopted the separation of the linearization step and the uniformization step before applying the, um, the homogenization procedure. So here, for example, we have the case of a perfect elastoplastic matrix, uh, which is reinforced by elastic spherical inclusions. Uh, we have here the two potentials that describe uh, this behavior. Now, uh, considering, or when taught here for the material properties, they're the same as the one used in Lilek and Shike 2013. And here the composite undergoes an isochoric loading. Here I represented the macroscopic response of the composite, the evolution of the damage stress averaged over the matrix, and then over the inclusion. So here we can see that macroscopically and locally in the matrix that the DIV predictions in, in blue are in very good agreement with the finite element calculations, uh, FFT calculations, and the RVP uh, predictions. And what was quite interesting here is considering this type of behavior not being uh, softening at all, we still see that the internal variable here being the plastic uh, strain or the component 3-3 of the plastic strain uh, localizing mainly on the upper corner and around the inclusion. So that at this point makes us wonder what would happen uh, behavior-wise in the case of uh, damage or in the case of a, of a behavior that exhibits softening. All right. So this question leads us to the development of the incremental variational principle for elasto uh, damageable composites. Well, first things first, we're going to um, frame the local behavior that we use, that, um, that we rely on for the development of the model. So when it comes to the free energy, which uh, usually takes this form, the first approximation we make is one of um, uh, general isotropy behavior, where the damaged elasticity tensor is written as a projection on both uh, on the two isotropic projectors with the bulk modulus on the spherical part and the shear modulus on the deviatoric one, both of them, of course, uh, being damaged. A common choice of simplification consists in uh, introducing a degradation function affecting the stiffness of the isotropic sound material CS, where the bulk modulus and the shear modulus are both affected by the same uh, degradation function. As for the complementary law, this would constitute a simple choice of the dissipation potential, which is positive scalar valued, convex with d dot and null at d dot equals zero. The yc d dot here corresponds to the dissipation, where yc is a characteristic of the elasto damageable material and is the yield damage energy rate and is here considered to be constant. We also have the irreversibility constraint. And now following what was introduced earlier, the constitutive behavior can also be written uh, under this form for this, uh, for this type of, of, of behavior, where our alpha is here specified to our uh, damage variable, which is a positive scalar. Here again, for this step right here, um, the local incremental potential is in introduced. Now, in this step, we are met with the second inconvenience that we have for this type of behavior. 
which mainly uh, using the incremental potential J, describing the local behavior sigma, we will uh, be met with a nonlinear coupling between uh, damage and elasticity. And at this stage, the application of the classical homogenization schemes is still deemed to be impossible, which is why we apply a linearization step. So this nonlinear um, coupling between elasticity uh, and damage can be dealt with in different ways. Here we choose to do the linearization by proposing uh, linearized incremental potential, J0, that approximates the incremental potential J. And so the key idea of the procedure here is to add and subtract J0 to J, such, it is, such as it is redefined as uh, J0 plus delta J delta J being the difference uh, between the two. And this way, J0 can be easily homogenized, whilst delta J can be estimated. So we define J0 in a form of, uh, of interest, uh, thus using two uh, uniform parameters per phase that we introduce. So we have A0R, which is a positive scalar associated with the damage, and C0R, a fourth order tensor related to um, elasticity. And we move forward by replacing J by its expression in the variational uh, problem. Now, a rigorous bound can be obtained by taking a supremum condition on delta J with respect to epsilon and, um, and, and, and our variable uh, D. And this upper bound can also be optimized, meaning we can take the, the smallest possible with, this, with respect to the reference variables that I introduce in J0 because but for now, I still have not specified their values or their expressions, and I precisely want to choose them in such a way that it minimizes this energy. And in fact, as in uh, Ponte Casaneda and Willis uh, 1992 or Ponte Casaneda of 2002, they have shown that it is possible to get better estimates by uh, taking stationary points. And that's exactly what, um, what is done here, giving us the new expression of the effective condensed uh, incremental potential. So the minimization of J0 uh, is what defines the energy of the, of the LCC, and its resolution uh, gives an estimate of the optimal damage. Now, this expression relies, of course, on the choice we make for the degradation function, but since we haven't specified it here yet, we'll just keep this notation for the damage resulting from this minimization at this point. And then the resolution of stationary conditions over the whole energy and delta J allows us to have an estimate of the reference parameters uh, introduced in the linearized incremental potential. So A0 here can be interpreted as the average of the elastic energy of the sound phase R, and C0 can be seen as the moduli of the LCC for every given uh, scale of D optimal or optimal damage. And finally, here we easily obtain the effective behavior of the composite, which in the end is obtained from the effective uh, energy of the LCC. So uh, in order to evaluate the model, we will apply it uh, to an isochoric two-phase composite, and that is through the implementation of an iterative algorithm, where we'll be solving this nonlinear uh, system, F1, F2, for A0 and C0 being the unknowns. In regards of the calculation of the second order moment and the effective properties of the material, we'll be using the uh, ashen strickman bounds. So we consider here a composite composed of an aluminum matrix reinforced with silicone carbide inclusions with a volume fraction of 25%. So these material properties can be found in uh, Fantonier Isle of 2020. And finally, for the loading, uh, we're just following what was previously done. Uh, the two-phase here undergoes an isochoric uh, macroscopic strain. All right, so for the analysis of the model's predictions, we consider two types of degradation functions. So for the micromechanical one here, we consider the uh, ponte castaneda willis damage law, where G takes the following form, uh, and which behavior is represented here in black, and a particular case can be distinguished from it as the Moritanaka damage law, where the Q would be null. So this damage law shows no softening, as it can be seen on the same graph in, uh, in green. Uh, but the damage, of course, uh, behavior can be seen when the unloading is applied. Now, 
using this degradation function in the calculation of, um, of the minimization of J0, the following expression of the optimal damage is obtained. So for immediate further analysis, we'll keep this second damage law, the Moritanaka, for which Q amounts to zero, and Q dash will be considered uh, 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 amounting to two. All right, so the second quadra quadratic uh, degradation function, which is commonly used in the, in the phase field approach, it shows this time a rough softening behavior beyond the threshold. And using this expression of G, or the degradation function, uh, we obtain the following uh, damage or optimal damage. Now, in both expressions, and considering the uniformity of the terms defining uh, this damage, we can conclude on the uniformity of the overall expression of the optimal damage here. However, here as it can be seen, the damage depends in both expressions of the second order moment of the uh, strain field, which is the quantity, as said before, that accounts for the uh, interface heterogeneities of the, of the field. Now, using these results, we can apply uh, our model for these two functions, where we represent here the macroscopic response, the strain averages over the matrix, and the inclusion. So we see here that for the Moritanaka model, uh, in the composite as well as in the matrix, the response does not show uh, softening. And we also observe for both models that there is a reinforcement effect, which is due to the presence of the inclusion. Concerning the quadratic degradation function, a uh, remarkable point here uh, is that the, the elastic inclusion, the purely elastic inclusion, although it continues to be loaded, uh, what could appear to be a softening actually isn't, but rather an unloading that is triggered by the development of damage in the, in the matrix. All right, so for a first analytical evalua evaluation of the developed model, we rely on a closed form solution for a porous material in the form of a hollow sphere. So here we follow the work of uh, Dornuan Kondo of 2016 by considering uh, a damaged elasticity in this form, uh, meaning the, the, the bulk modulus is not uh, altered by damage. Uh, and this allows the 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 the, the obta or allows obtaining the, the the closed form solution. So the methodology methodology these authors used or proposed uh, is based on two equations: the coupled Lamy-Navier equ equation, depending on the damage and the displacement, and the damage criterion. So the resolution of these two equations allows to establish the analytical uh, solution. These authors have worked with two micromechanical uh, degradation functions, uh, namely the Ponte Casanada Willis and Moritanaka, that were both introduced uh, previously. Uh, we proposed here new specific development and closed form solution for this quadratic degradation function, which is the one we're going to be keeping for uh, the rest of our study. So, here what is interesting is that the comparison of the prediction of the homogenization model with the behavior of the closed form solutions gives a rather uh, satisfactory agreement. So after this first analysis or first analytical evaluation, we move on to the numerical one. And so here, OK, so to, to ease our way or to motivate the choices we made upon uh, this step, we begin by considering a local damage model for the numerical computations as a first intuitive uh, step, considering the, the, the nature of the model that we have uh, developed. Now, it is well known that this local damage is quite flawed, as, for example, it shows quite a strong mesh sensitivity, which can clearly be seen here on the macroscopic response, as well as on the damage distribution within the cell uh, for these three uh, mesh sizes, which Therefore, this makes it necessary for us to make use of nonlinear damage formulations instead. And so we use the variational uh, gradient damage model. This consists in minimizing a two-field energy functional with respect to the displacement and the damage. Uh, so this approach can be interpreted as a variational uh, gradient damage model allow, uh, following uh, Fame out of 2011 and Marigot of 2016. So the functional minimization is done here through an alternate minimization algorithm where the elasticity problem is solved for, is solved for a fixed damage, and then the damage optimization problem is solved for um, a fixed displacement, and therefore solved sequentially. 
So in the GSM framework, this variational approach can be uh, interpreted uh, in the form of thermodynamics-based potentials, where the main difference here uh, with what we have introduced earlier in our model uh, is the dissipation potential, where we see the appearance of a gradient damage uh, term. So regarding the, the internal length, uh, by postulating that the energy dissipated by damage is equivalent to the Griffith fractor energy, this allows us to establish a relationship between L0, which is the characteristic length, uh, GC, the fractor energy, and YC introduced uh, earlier. So this approach is also well known as the AT1 model, which derives from the regularization uh, model of Ambrose Tortorelli. All right, so now regarding the pre-processing uh, input data, we consider a matrix reinforced by a spherical inclusion. Now, considering the symmetries that we have, uh, we'll be using only the one eighth of a cubic cell, as it is represented right here with a three millimeter side and uh, an inclusion of 2.3 millimeter of radius. So for the mesh we use, it's a four node tetrahedrons with a mesh size of 0 0.15 millimeter. So for a more in-hand resolution, uh, the numerical calculations have been carried out using uh, Python uh, and Phoenix library. And for the damage optimization problem, we used the Petsy library. The material properties here are the same as the ones uh, we used previously that can also be found in uh, Fontenier AL 2020. Uh, with the addition of the GC, which amounts here to six Newton per millimeters, and using the established relationship between L0, GC, and YC for the AT1 model introduced uh, previously, we find an L0 that amounts to 0 0.77 millimeters, with the mesh size here being inferior to it as it would be desired. So uh, for the boundary conditions, we use here specific kinematic uh, uniform boundary conditions in the form of an isochoric strain, which is piloted um, uh, with the use of uh, applied displacement on the three outer bounds of the cell. Uh, now regarding these three outer bounds or the loaded faces of the, of the microstructure, in order for us to prevent damage from localizing on it, we enforced the condition of a null damage on them. All right, so here's a representation of the macroscopic response of the composite, as well as the average stress over the matrix and in the inclusion. Now, overall, what we see here is that we have a distinct elastic uh, phase followed by a damageable one. Now, regarding the theoretical model, we are in the purely elastic phase until the drop or, or until the softening takes place, whereas in the finite element calculations, locally the damage appears before and thus induce, inducing a small hardening transition preceding the softening, which is due here to structural strengthening. Overall here, we can say that we have a qualitative agreement between the two approaches, as the model here reproduces the same uh, tendencies with a notable difference still in the threshold and in the, the, the softening behavior. On the first graph, we also um, represent the damage evolution for both approaches. Here it is important to note that for the numerical simulations, we represent what we could call a pseudo damage, where we use the same formulation or the same relationship that is that was attained through the application of the of the model to make sure that we were comparing the same quantities. Uh, so here we see that we have a relatively similar evolution, which can be obser uh, observed in the form. Of course, uh, the, the, with the thresholds, of course, being here uh, different. And this can be seen in the damage evolution and distribution on the cell. So also here on this graph, just for Intel in gray, I also represent the average of damage that is calculated over uh, the matrix. So here we can see that the damage appears around this level of macroscopic strain with the highest value amounting to 0 0.0046. Then we see that there is a gradual or a progressive evolution as for this level of macroscopic strain, uh, where the highest value reached is uh, 0 0.13 or 14. And to finally localize uh, and reach the value 1 locally in the matrix, this shows 
um, that the composite behavior can be homogenized up until this macroscopic strain level, which more concretely gives us enough room to uh, study the damage-induced behavior uh, before the occurrence of fracture. Now, regarding the field statistics and through the stress fluctuations, uh, here we represent the evolution of the projection of the stress fluctuations over the deviatoric projector. Uh, so here, when comparing the model to the numerical simulations, the tendencies are not the same. Uh, in the model, there is an increase and decrease following what we see in the mechanical responses, but for the FE simulations, the stress fluctuations keep on increasing beyond the damage threshold, which naturally, of course, spiked our confusion. So to gain more insight, we wanted to, um, to see the behavior of the stress fluctuations components, which are represented right down below. Now here, this time, the tendencies are the same, and, but the difference between the two components is not the same as the model, uh, where it very much slightly decreases, whereas in the numerical calculations, the difference actually uh, increases. At this point, it is probable that a careful examination of this stress fluctuations will probably need a projection over the, the spherical projector as well. Finally, uh, it is interesting to look at the energetic aspects during the damage evolution. Uh, here we have the elastic energy, the dissipated energy, which is composed of a local term and, uh, and the damage gradient term. Their evolutions here are represented as well. And it can be seen that uh, the local component of the dissipation potential is very similar to the gradient damage one where we see here they're the same of the same order. And although this constitutes quite an important difference with our model fundamentally, it nevertheless, there is a reasonable adequacy between the two approaches still. So now we can move on to the last part of the presentation, which consists in extending the model we have already built uh, and evaluating it to a case exhibiting a positive hardening. Now, what motivated this study, this is justified by the existence of composites of this type, uh, a silicon carbide, carb carbide fiber composite, which have a certain um, anisotropy. So here we have uh, experimental results obtained in Gasserial in 1996 for two tensile tests. For these composite materials, we see in their response that although we have a clear damage, uh, these composite materials do not generate a softening regime. So our goal here is to build a model uh, in which there is hardening that would be explained in the absence of that would explain the absence of, of, of softening. Uh, this extension calls for a modification in the dissipation potential mainly, uh, where the on the contrary of what was seen previously, the yield energy Y C here. Uh, that used to be constant here depends on the damage through the parameter eta, which is the one uh, driving or piloting uh, the hardening. So for different gamma and eta values, the intertwined relation between elasticity and damage will not be the same. For example, for a null gamma and eta mounting to, to, to one, we have the well-known AT2 model without threshold for which damage evolves from the very start of the loading. Uh, now, this model will not be presented today, but it can be found in the manuscript, of course. Uh, but here, we'll mainly focus on the AT1 extended model. Uh, when it comes to the AT1, which is the one we've been studying thus far, uh, it is defined with a gamma amounting to 1 and a null eta. And as we saw, uh, there's the elastic regime followed by the softening one. Now, the model of main interest here is the AT1 extended for which gamma will amount to 1, which uh, allows us to keep the uh, elastic uh, regime up until a certain threshold. And considering different values of eta, this will, which is the driving or piloting uh, parameter of the hardening, the elastic regime will be first followed by a hardening one delaying the softening regime, which will come um, after it. All right, so now we take a look at the um, theoretical reformulation of the previous variational model for this case of, uh, of damage law. From the thermodynamic uh, potential, we can write the following considerative uh, equations where, again, we have 
the considerative law and Biot equation, just as previously. However, here we can see that we have a dependency on D, on the dissipative part of the Biot equation. Now, however, if we consider this variational problem, it requires the local incremental potential to be written under this form, meaning with the dependent dependency of dn rather than d. Uh, and this potential is actually associated with this following Bio equation, where the dissipative part will be associated to dn again rather than d. So the hypothesis that is forth put forth here uh, is that we approximate the above considerative equations with these ones right here. Uh, and it is to note that a similar approximation can also be found in Ortiz and Stenev 1999. All right, so following the same procedure uh, introduced earlier, we obtain the same nonlinear system as previously, with the difference, of course, that lies in the expression of uh, the optimal damage that is obtained through the minimization of J0 with respect to D. So here, by considering three values of eta, uh, which is, again, the parameter that pilots the, the, the hardening, here is the macroscopic response and uh, the damage evolution. So here we start in the, the macroscopic response. There is an elastic regime. And on the contrary of the AT1 model, the elastic regime is first followed by a hardening transi transitionary regime leading to the softening one. And it can be seen also in the damage evolution that the positive hardening limits the effects of softening. And here for two values of eta, so here we consider three and five, the hardening effects will be more important as we increase the value, whereas the damage values will uh, be decreasing. So now that our model is set, we would like to uh, numerically evaluate it. Uh, for this matter, we also follow exactly what has been uh, introduced earlier with a difference here in the dissipation function and the normalization parameter with CW taking the following form, where um, for this approach, we were inspired by the work done in the PhD by Kosidi Puchve in 2021. Uh, then again, here, of course, an alternate uh, minimization procedure is applied with the same input data as uh, previously. So. Here we've considered the value of eta being uh, 5, and we represent the macroscopic response alongside the stress averages over the matrix and the inclusion. Uh, for this model, the internal, internal length, L0, is calculated using the previous uh, relationship that was established uh, through GC and YC, which is calculated to 0 0.39 millimeters. So here globally, in the composite and in the matrix, we observe a rather good agreement between the homogenization model and the numerical simulations with a qualitative difference still observed in the, in the inclusion. Here, concerning the representation of the damage evolutions, well, in this case, they're not as far from each other as it was the case for the AT1 model. So we can clearly see that the softening effects being uh, limited by the positive hardening makes the model overall more relevant. So moving on to the damage evolution within the cell, uh, here we have the damage appearance with the highest value reaching 0 0.011. Uh, then we can see the progressive and diffuse uh, evolution of, of, of the damage uh, in the matrix. So here in the stage right before the softening takes place, the damage reaches the highest value of uh, 0 0.73. And finally, at the end, where the damage is um, complete. It has reached one locally uh, in the matrix. Regarding the field statistics, so again here we study only the projection of the stress fluctuations over the deviatoric part or the over the deviatoric uh, projector. Here we can see that there is a relatively better agreement than what was seen previously. Uh, but yet again, in the finite element simulations, if we continue, the fluctuation actually keep on increasing uh, with the same observations made for the stress fluctuations components evaluation. Um, however, with a less uh, diverging difference in the numerical results. So now the interesting aspects of the energies uh, evolutions for this model if we immediately take a look at the evolutions of the local dissipated energy and the gradient damage one, well, now we see that the local components takes over this time, being almost similar to the whole dissipated energy. And this adds more relevance to the choice we made 
uh, at the beginning in the numerical evaluation for this specific uh, model. And finally, an important point that should have been pointed out earlier is that the unilateral effects are not taken into account in the formulation of, our, uh, of the developed model, uh, whereas it is taken into account in the um, numerical simulations. So through, through the unilateral effects, we um, basically take into account the opening and the reclosure of microcracks when applying a cyclic loading. And this implies that the slope of the first load will be different from the slope of the second load in a traction compression cycle load loading. Um, more concretely, this implies a rewriting of the free energy in the form of two branches. The first one, well, the, where the bulk modulus is going to be damaged, and a second one where it is not, which is also a choice through uh, experimental data, etc. So here we represent the macroscopic response for the AT1 model and its extension to the case of hardening. We can see that the model here compares relatively well in the first phase of loading, which is what we saw earlier, where the unilateral effects do not com come in play. The differences that we see, however, are in the predictions of the numerical models and the, 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 the theoretical model due to the fact that the unilateral effect is not taken into account, where it is majorly seen in the second part of, of the loading. So, okay, so now to everyone's relief, we have finally reached the conclusion of the PhD defense and the perspective part. Uh, so this work has been done in majorly two aspects, a theoretical one and a numerical one. Uh, in the first aspect, uh, through the extension of the AIV model uh, to the case of elasto-damageable composites, well, we were able to do so through a relatively simple linearization procedure, uh, which gives, gave us a pretty versatile framework to work with. Uh, and although it does give us a uniform damage per phase, we're kind of saved by the fact that it depends on the second order moment of the strain field. Uh, and also considering the simplicity and nature of our model, on the contrary of the case of elastoplasticity, the resolution of our nonlinear system F1, F2 does not lead to multiple choices, which makes the, not the numerical resolution much easier. And through its resolution and analysis, we were able to see that the softening mechanisms in the matrix uh, affect uh, quite grandly the effective behavior of the composite. Now, regarding the numerical aspects of our work, uh, where we carried out the full field simulations using the variational approach of Bourdin through careful contemplation, not only did it allow us to numerically evaluate our model, it also gave us an insight of how the damage evolves within the composite. And overall, we, we obtained a pretty remarkable agreement uh, of observed, uh, uh, or better one it is attained when in the case of harden hardenable, uh, elasto-damageable matrix. Now, concerning the perspectives, uh, there are many. The more important, I would say, uh, regard the, the first important one is uh, related to the full field simulations, where we think it would be interesting to complexify the microstructure that is studied, um, where we can consider, for example, a multiple inclusion one, as it was done by Vincent Gauthier in his thesis in 2022. Um, also considering a fiber composite would be interesting. It can also be a good perspective to confront our model predictions to available experimental data done on uh, composites. Now, considering the theoretical um, developments of the model, a first important path to study is maybe taking into account the unilateral effects that are due to, to damage. Um, and the second one, well, it is no secret that in this case of damage, there is loss of convexity that is attained where we have elasticity and damage that are, that are combined. Um, so an important development that should be done is to apply a relaxation uh, method, which consists in a quasi-convexification of the free energy. And with this, I conclude my PhD defense, and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you.